Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the miniseries version of Stephen King's It, which was aired in two parts on ABC in 1990. Originally conceived as an 8-10 to 10 hour television epic, writer Lawrence D. Cohen was forced to whittle it down to a mere three hours. A difficult task, given the source material was an 1,100-page novel. Look at this thing! It tells the story of a group of middle school-aged outcasts called the Losers Club in the small town of Derry, Maine. They experience terror and torment at the hands of Pennywise the Dancing Clown, an embodiment of a greater evil force haunting Derry. 30 years later, Pennywise returns to plague the town once more, stealing kids and eating them up, so the Losers Club is forced to regroup in order to try and vanquish the evil force once and for all. Although Tim Curry's portrayal of Pennywise is the most memorable part of this production, the story of It is one of King's finest, a poignant tale of making friends, coming of age, and facing your demons. Of course, you can't really face your demons if you get killed by an evil clown. And how many people end up becoming victims of Pennywise? Well, let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with scrapbook photos and some opening credits that pimp out Tim Curry's appearance, as they should since he's the reason we're all here. A picture of a theater fades from 1960 into 1990, the present time for the adult storyline in the film. A little girl named Lori Ann is riding her trike as a storm approaches, but before she can get back inside, she sees something by the clothesline. What do you see in there, little girl? Hi. Oh, just a creepy ass clown. Cool. The clown gets even scarier and then charges at Lori in a first person shot, killing her off screen. Just a heads up as we start off here, a lot of the kills are done this way. It's a little unsafe satisfying, but probably a result of the miniseries budget it has. We're just gonna have to deal with it and look forward to the theatrical release of the new It coming out next week. Lori Ann's murder draws the interest of Mike Hanlon, the first member we meet of the Losers Club, and played by Tim Reed, who was the dad in Sister Sister, so that's fun. Apparently, there's been a string of kids disappearing or winding up dead, and Mike thinks it's terrible. There's something terribly wrong here in Derry. Absolutely terrible. After getting dismissed by the police chief, Mike notices a picture sitting by a tree, and it's not just a child actor's headshot. It's a little boy he recognizes as someone named Georgie. He takes to his diary to tell the audience that he's freaking out, man, over the picture he just found and that it's time to get the band back together. So let's meet our ensemble cast. First up, hanging out in this mansion in England is Bill, a horror writer rocking an awful ponytail who's busy working on a screenplay. Part of Bill's purpose is to be an extremely obvious stand-in for Stephen King himself. If they're gonna hire somebody to mangle one of my books, might as well be me. He's having dinner with his lovely wife Audra, an actress set to star in the picture he's working on. With their meals interrupted by a phone call from Mike who tells him quite plainly, It's back. Sure. And yeah, it also brings back Bill's childhood star. Even more traumatizing for Bill is when Mike mentions Georgie's name, which triggers a flashback for Bill and our first extended look at the movie's other timeline. One day in 1960, when Bill was sick, he gave his little brother Georgie a paper boat to go mess around with. It actually looks like a pretty fun time for a little kid, chasing a toy boat as it sails down the street along the curbside. But fun times go south when the boat slips into the gutter. As Georgie's looking down after it, the clothesline clown pops up. They have a great conversation that's worth the price of admission alone since Tim Curry is and always will be magnificent. Georgie tells the clown he can't talk to strangers, so the clown goes ahead and solves that little problem. I, Georgie, am Pennywise the Dancing Clown. You are Georgie, so now we know each other. Pennywise invites Georgie to come hang with him in his subterranean clown spot, but it takes a lot of coaxing to convince him, including the promise of balloons. Do they float? Oh yes, they float. That's enough to get Georgie to reach down for his boat, at which point Pennywise gets weird. You float! Oh. Pennywise grabs his arm and goes to eat the camera, and that's the way the Georgie crumbles for our second kill of the film. Later, we hear how his arm was torn off, which is pretty friggin' badass. But again, most of these kills are gonna be off screen like this. Sorry. After the funeral, Bill looks through a photo album and gets freaked out when a picture of Georgie winks at him. People forget that pictures moving like that was creepy as hell before Harry Potter came along and made it magical. But not even the boy who lived could make spontaneously bleeding photo albums not creepy. And what's worse is that Bill has no one to talk to about the changes he may be experiencing in his photo album, since his parents don't seem to to notice the blood at all. With that flashback taken care of, we get our first of many, many, many match cuts back into the present, where Bill says to himself that he had forgotten everything that had happened back then. He goes to leave despite his wife's protestations, who says she's willing to go with him, but he tells her no and gives her a very forceful hug. Now on to New York City, where John Ritter is a drunk architect named Ben Hansen, who's so dope he wins awards for architecting, even if he's not exactly responsible with them. And let me just say, I miss John Ritter a lot. He's having a great time right now though, chilling with his Time Magazine cover and playing drunken rich guy grab ass with his lady friend. He starts telling her about how he used to be fat, but just like with Bill, a phone call interrupts him. Mike tells him it's come back and asks how much he remembers. Very little. Mike then asks Ben if he'll keep his promise to return to Derry. Ben agrees to, but he don't look happy about it. He gives his lady the hand because it's 1990, then goes to a skyscraper to have a drunken flashback. Ben was the new kid in town who wasted no time falling for this quiet girl in class named Beverly Marsh, and who also wasted no time falling victim to some post-war bullying by the class greaser Henry Bowers, just because he's fat. I'm putting air quotes every time I say Ben's fat, by the way. That kid barely 
qualifies as husky. Henry gets detention and blames Ben, so after school when Ben's walking home, he gets harassed by Henry and his crony greasers, Vic and Belch. Yes, that kid's name is Belch. <laughs> That's why. Henry tries to carve his name into Ben's stomach, but Ben kicks him away and tumbles down a hill into an area called the Barrens, eventually hiding in a pipe while the greasers pick on Bill and his tiny asthmatic friend, Eddie Kasprak. After the greasers leave, the three losers bond over tossing rocks into water, because that's what kids did before they had endless hours of cat videos available in their pockets. Later on in the day, after his cousin teases him about a love letter he's writing for Bev, he returns to the Barrens and is shocked to find the waving image of his late father who was killed in Korea. Turns out his dad's relocated. That's my home now, son! God, it always makes me sad to see a dad get a shitty new place after a separation. Can't be too sad, though. He's got balloons. And guess what? They all flow. Oh, and also, he's a clown. Pennywise disappears, and then Ben dodges a mossy bone hand from a nasty skeleton guy who tells Ben that he'll float down there. Not sure where exactly they keep talking about, but it sounds like some kind of underground zero-g simulator. The flashback ends, and adult Ben is sad. Now let's blast on over to Chicago to meet up with Bev, who's a successful fashion designer. She's dating a stereotypical 80s businessman whose favorite movie is definitely Wall Street for all the wrong reasons. This guy is a super doucher. Oh, Bevy. Don't ever contradict me in front of Pam again, okay? So he probably won't be the most understanding when Bev gets a call from Mike later that night. In fact, when he comes back and finds her packing, he gets so incest that he straight up slaps her in the face and threatens her with a belt. Bev knows getting back to Derry is super important though, so she throws shit at him and leaves. In the taxi ride to the airport, she has her own little flashback to her childhood in 1960. She remembers the time she found a poem on her porch, which was unbeknownst to her, left by Ben. When her father finds her with the note and reads it, he gets scary pissed. Pissed enough to slap her in the face. Damn, man, can people stop slapping Bev in the face? for just like five minutes, please? She runs away from her dad and Ben comforts her, then takes her to the Barrens to meet Eddie and Bill. Ooh, she liked Bill. Then they're joined by two more losers. Richie Tozier is played by Seth Green and is the kind of guy who's probably funny for like five minutes, then just a real drag to be around. The other dude is Stanley Uris, an uptight Jewish kid who wears that scout uniform a lot. I don't know, maybe it helps him get the ladies or something. They bond over a montage where they build a dam together out of wood and old car parts, I guess. And by the end of it, their dam is successful and they've learned the power of friendship and they're free to splash around in what surely must be disease-ridden Stillwater. On the way home, Bev looks longingly after Bill and quotes Ben's poetry, apparently thinking Bill is the author. Sorry about your luck, Ben. When Bev's getting ready for bed that night, she hears a few voices coming from inside the sink saying that everything floats down there. Who's down there, you might ask? I'm Vicky Burroughs. I'm Matthew O'Connor. We're all the dead kids. Yep, all the dead kids. Every last one, I guess. Then a balloon inflates and blows up and it splatters blood everywhere. But when Bev gets her dad to come help her, it doesn't look like anything to him. The blood spurting sink warns Bev that she'll die if she tries to fight Pennywise and she sinks to her bathroom floor just in time for a match cut back to the present. Still got three losers to go, so on to New York where a grown ass Eddie is on his way out the door having gotten the call from Mike off screen. His mother frets about, telling him there's nothing back in Derry for him, but Eddie takes off in a limo of the company he owns, ready to match cut his way back to 1960. His flashback takes place in the Paramount, that movie theater from the opening credits, where the losers watch the Wolfman movie. After Eddie accidentally kicks his popcorn over the balcony onto Henry and the other greasers, Richie takes them all to the danger zone by purposefully pouring his soda all over their heads. The losers run away from the theater, giddy over their guerrilla strike against the bullies, and Eddie says he's having the time of his life until his mom comes out and shoes his friends away. She reminds him not to shower at school because of germs, but the gym teacher tells him he needs to so he won't be a smelly boy. Eddie heads to the showers by himself, and the faucets start taking on a mind of their own, getting hotter and expanding out from the wall to start covering Eddie and blocking him in from escaping. Then things get even weirder when clown hands start coming out of the drain. Pennywise pulls apart the shower floor and pops out of it like some kind of evil clown diglet. He teases Eddie for a while before putting on his scary face. Oh boy, Tim Curry, you are one scary evil fucking clown, dude. Even the movie's like, that's enough of that shit. And we dissolve back into the present to wrap up Eddie's relatively short flashback. Next loser up is Richie in Beverly Hills. If you thought he was obnoxious as a goofster preteen, then hold on to your butts, because now he's an 80s stand-up comic and it doesn't get much worse than that. Plus, he's not Seth Green anymore, so that sucks. He's doing well, though, performing on TV, but Mike's phone call brings back memories so upsetting he slides all up next to his toilet to pray to the match cut guy. His prayers are answered and we're taken back to 1960 to story time with the kids. They talk about what they want to be when they grow up, and Billy looks like he's gonna tell them about the bloody photo album, but then a super Irish cop interrupts them and tells them they should always stick together because kids be disappearing, yo. They put their hands in and tell Officer O'Krupke they'll be safe. Hard to stay safe at school when you've got murderous greasers about, though. Richie manages to keep his spirits up. Harry, Curly, and Mom. <laughs> beep, beep, Richie. And even follow follow up his soda trick with some lunch food to the chest. He runs into a teacher who demands he clean up his mess, but when Richie goes to the basement to get a mop, he's greeted by a freaking werewolf. The werewolf costume doesn't look great, but you know, just pretend it looks awesome and maybe you can imagine the terror Richie's supposed to be feeling right now. As Richie's running away, the werewolf turns into Pennywise. Beep, beep, Richie. Who plays that his single of his that everyone always loves to hear. They all flow down here. 
Then he gets all creepy sexy on Richie. Although to be fair, anything Tim Curry does is sexy, so I'm not even sure he was trying. Seth Green Richie goes to bed terrified that night, and Match cuts his way back to 80s stand-up comic Richie. Back in the dairy library, Mike looks at a photograph and decides that it's a good time to have a flashback of his own, so he reminisces about the time he was giving a presentation in class on the historical disasters that have befallen dairy. He earns the ire of Henry Bowers and his new expanded group of greasers for being black, so they chase him down the street and into a gravel pit construction area. Here the other losers are hanging out and talking about how they've all seen Pennywise now, except for Scout Trooper Stan, who's skeptical of the whole situation. Stan's too logical for this kind of thing. Such a thing just isn't empirically possible. But the others assure him it's real and the cause of all the missing children lately. When Mike runs into them for help, they defend him from the greasers by throwing rocks at him. Nothing like a good old-fashioned rock fight to really get the juices flowing. And besides, that's what kids did back before they could just get into flame wars with each other on Twitter. They scare the bullies away, but not before Henry promises to kill them all someday. Mike officially joins their club and they become seven. Lucky seven. They take a group picture together to commemorate the formation of their group, and honestly, I took a very similar group picture with my nerdy friends back in high school at a construction yard we'd always go play airsoft at. Yeah, I'm the one with the center part in the Star Wars shirt. The kids go through Mike's photo album and find drawings of Pennywise from 200 years ago in Derry. They also drop the title in this scene. It's not a man. It. It. And the pages freak out and another still comes to life with Pennywise running up to the kids and telling them he'll kill them all and that he's everything they've ever been afraid of. He reaches out to grab them and it's way too much for Stan, who shuts the album and tries to deny what they all just saw. He finally admits that he saw it, but he's reluctant to join in the club's call to action to do something about it. But after Bill gives an impassioned plea for them all to help him kill it, they huddle up in a friendship hug and agree. Mike wakes up from his flashback and his section ends with a scary balloon pop. Spooky. If you're counting along, you know there's only one more loser to meet, so we head to Atlanta, Georgia, where where Stan is living a very comfortable life. Oh, and he's played by Richard Monster, who was Clark the dog handler in The Thing. Looks different without a beard or a bullet in his forehead. He gets the phone call from Mike, but Stan's real freaked out and says he can't promise he'll make it back to Derry with the rest of them. He leaves his wife to go upstairs and run a bath, and yep, you guessed it, Match cut his way back to 1960. The Lucky Seven are practicing with a slingshot, shooting at cans and glass bottles in a creek because that's what kids did before they had hyper-realistic first-person shooters to play. They all suck at it, except Bev, who shoots a perfect 10 out of 10 and is thus designated the party's ranged attack. Hacker. Richie hooks her up with a magical item, some solid silver earrings, and the kids figure that as long as they believe in it, those babies can kill Pennywise. Sufficiently armed and leveled up, the kids head to the sewers, stopping only to reaffirm their friendship with a bunch of puffs on Eddie's inhaler. Although Stan is kind of reluctant and the last one to do it. Stan? They head inside, unaware that Henry and his cronies are watching them, ready to follow them in and make sure they never come back out. Kids killing other kids, you know, it's, it's what they did before internet. Inside the sewer, Henry launches a plan that involves Vic going off by himself to corral the kids into an ambush by Henry and Belt. This doesn't work out so great for Vic, though, because a super bright light starts moving underneath the floor towards where he's standing, eventually popping out of a grate and coming at him for another POV kill, getting all up in his face with them bright lights, kind of like a cop waving a flashlight in a drunk driver's face. The kids venture deeper into the sewers, only to have Stan get grabbed by Henry and Belch, who reminds him what his name is. <laughs> <laughs> he burped. It gets me every time. Henry takes his knife and starts picking off Stan's buttons, but before he can get super psycho murder greaser on him, that bright light be coming down the pike again, and it's headed straight towards those kids. Oh shit! It bursts out of the pipe, knocking away Henry and Stan, and sucking up Belch back into the pipe. Belch gets folded in half and pulled into the pipe for a bloodless yet still pretty eerie kill. The fourth of the movie, and the first to be kind of actually on screen. The light comes back and pops out of the pipe to say hello to the boys again, but Stan's smart enough to GTFO while Henry sits there dumbfounded. We don't get to see what he does, but whatever it is, it scares him enough to turn his hair white. The light ignores him for now, though, opting instead to chase Stan down the tunnels as he runs to reunite with his friends. They huddle up together and fall to the ground as the light approaches them and passes overhead, where we get a glimpse of the thing's bright light underbelly. I don't know, guys, that might just be a TMNT float with some sick LEDs on it. It might be okay. After it passes over them, a fog fills the chamber. I love the smell of sewer fog in the morning. And then all the kids start seeing things that scare them, like a little dead Georgie for Bill, abusive Papa Marsh for Beverly, and some manicured werewolf claws for Richie. Stan tries to find his center by repeating the scout oath to himself a whole bunch of times, but that doesn't stop Pennywise from appearing out of nowhere and then kidnapping poor Stan away from the group. He tells Stan to be afraid. You all taste so much better when you're afraid. And laughs at their threat to kill him, because as he says, he's eternal and the eater of worlds. Right as he goes to nom down on Stan though, Eddie steps up to the plate to be a hero. This is better acid, you slime! Believing makes it real, so Pennywise's face starts melting off, and Bev takes her one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow, Bev! She doesn't. She hits him in the head, causing a bright light to shine out. But before she can get off a second shot for a confirmed kill, Pennywise flip jumps his way to freedom, hopping straight into a drain with a special effect that doesn't quite hold up. Sorry, miniseries it. Bill grabs his hand in an attempt to keep him from escaping, but the hand becomes a claw and Pennywise gets away. The kids have no choice but to hope that they did enough damage to kill it, so they leave despite Bill's desire to follow it. Outside the sewer, Bill makes them all swear an oath that if it isn't dead, we'll come back. 
One by one, the kids all put their hands in and swear allegiance, although Stan takes a while and is the last to do so. Stan's really not coping with this whole thing that well, guys. A point that's proven when we jump back to 1990 and his wife comes upstairs to find him in the bathtub with his wrist slit. Stan has killed himself, simply too terrified and unwilling to face Pennywise once more. He leaves a bloody note on the wall, and part one of It concludes with his wife screaming in anguish. <laughs> And that's gonna be it for today, kids. The miniseries aired in two parts back in 1990, and I'm gonna have to give it the same treatment with the kill count, because there's just too much story to fit into a single video. So far, we've got five kills, though, which is a little more than you were expecting, I'm sure. How many more are left? We'll find out on Friday when I release part two of this video. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey guys, thanks a lot for watching part one of my Kill Count for It. I want to thank some of my patrons like Desiree Peters, Brendan Donovan, and William McClure. If you want to join the Patreon family, click that button right over there. You'll have access to polls and updates and all sorts of things. Hey also, if you're in the Philadelphia area and you're looking for a pet, why don't you try out Pals Adoption and Life Care Society? They're on Facebook, and I hear they're a pretty cool place. Part two's on Friday. See you then.